Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good, good, good. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, it's good to see you guys after a, a week off. Um, <clears throat> if this is your first Sunday, I saw several new people. Uh, thank you for checking us out. Listen, there's a care card in that seat back pocket in front of you. It would be great if you would do us a huge favor and fill that out, um, and you can place that in the black boxes as you, uh, as you exit um, at the end of service, and either Ryan Sisney, our executive pastor, or I uh, will reach out to you this week and answer any questions, or if you've got prayer requests, um, go ahead and jot those down. We've got a prayer team that will meet here tomorrow night, um, and, and I mean, we, we pray. Uh, we, we really pray. We believe at Hansville Church here. We pray first. Um, it's how God chooses to move and actively move uh, amongst the earth. So go ahead and uh, fill those out. And also, in case you don't know, our Thursday groups have started back. Um, <clears throat> for those men in here who have been in that group, uh, wow. Uh, God has really moved uh, in ours. I hear some excellent uh, feedback from, from the ladies in their group as well with their study that is basically just, just gold. So I would ask you to pray about being here. Thursday night, 5.30, we'll feed you. We'll go into a group at 6 o'clock, and we'll get you out of here promptly uh, at 7.30. Uh, so this is our 30th week in Acts. We've been in Acts for 30 weeks. Uh, we're, in, we're in chapter 20. Um, and, and what I want to do, I want to kind of quickly recap the last 30 weeks um, on how the church grew and how Jesus' apostles, even at the very beginning, were like, Rabbi, are you, are, are you gonna now come and, and, and are you gonna set up your kingdom? In, in other words, what they were asking in layman's terms is, are you gonna lay the smack down on the Romans and, and elevate the Jewish nation to where we can rule everything? And Jesus said, yes, it's not gonna work like that. It's not. And then he says in Acts 1.8, he says this, but you will receive power Dunamis, it's like dynamite. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we've seen how the church has exploded over the last 30 weeks and we've watched how God has unit. And, and one of the big ones that he's used is Peter and Paul, a guy named Paul. And, and Paul was a guy running around killing followers of Jesus. He was running around, locking them up, and then he met the real Jesus. And this is what I don't want anyone to discount today. The power when you meet the real Jesus. It is insane. And it changes you from the inside out. And so then Paul goes on uh, this missionary journey, and we've watched him on these three great journeys um, th that he's been on. And the last one was in Ephesus. And it's where he spent three years of his life doing life with the Ephesian church and raising up elders to lead the church. And if we remember two weeks ago, there was a mighty uproar in the city of Ephesus, and they put him in a coliseum that held 25,000 people. Uh, that's roughly about the size of the Dean Dome in Chapel Hill for you Carolina fans. And, and well, I guess a lot, there's not a lot here. I guess it's more like Clemson fans. But anyway, yeah, I heard it. But anyway, so basically, th there was a huge uproar, and, and Paul and him had to go on the, on the defensive, and, and God used the mayor uh, basically, of Ephesus to, to calm it down. And so our main reading today is going to be uh, uh, Acts 20. And, and we're going to cover the whole chapter. Now, we're going to do a flyover of the first half because the first half is, is very historical. It's very important. But I really want to get to when Paul says his last words to the church in Ephesus. But I want to start out in, in verse 1 and 2, and it, and it says this. After the uproar ceased, which is the, uh, the huge, mighty uproar, and this was after people brought all their books in repentance of the books of the wizards and, and everything, the sorcery and everything, they burned upwards of $6 million of books in current day value in repentance to try to show God that they are turned away from their old life to turn to God. And after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples... And after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. That, that's current day Greece. And when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement. You see how two times in there the encouragement's in there? He came to Greece. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria... His goal there, we learned from other letters that he wrote to churches, was he wanted to try to get back to Jerusalem by Passover. 
he decided to return back through Macedonia. So a, a couple of points in these, in these short verses. Number one, are you an encourager? Uh, that's, that's the one thing that I think is so absent from the church in the West. We're, we're just not encouraging. We don't encourage people. And you see what Paul's objective was there, to encourage them. Was Paul a missionary? Yes. Did Paul want to go reach lost people? Yes. But if you'll look at the majority of his second and third missionary journeys, it was to encourage and build up and equip. And folks, I tell you, over the next three or four months, listen, before we can go out there, we've got to get healthy in here. We've got to get tight-knit in here. We are, those of you who are sold out to Hendersonville Church, we are a family. And when I say we're a family, it's a family that's bonded tighter than blood. And I know people don't like to hear that. And, and I know that that makes some people feel uncomfortable, but that's what we got to get back to at the church. And, and Paul makes this abundantly clear through this context. And, and these few words summarize what must have been over a year of adventures for Paul and his companions. And so it, it's roughly a 1,500-mile journey where he goes up the western coast of Turkey and then back down through the, the different churches of Philippi and Berea and Athens and Corinth. And he, and he parks at Corinth for three months. And subsequently, for, for those of you who like the, you know, the nerdy stuff, we learn from subsequent letters that that's where he penned the book Romans. He penned the book Romans there. And so he wants to get back, but he learns that there's a plot made that they're going to assassinate him on a ship. You see, it's real easy because they had these pilgrimage ships. So it was all Jews trying to get Jerusalem by the Passover. Well, all they had to do was put three or four dudes on there, put Paul on the boat, and guess what they do? They just chuck him over. So Paul was made aware of that, so he decides to go back on foot, back through Macedonia, and so... We then come to a place called Troas, where they, they converge there. And you can read that. That's in verses 7 through 12. And, and Paul's getting ready to leave that port. And he goes up into an upper room with the church there. And he preaches till midnight. He starts at sundown. And he preaches till midnight. How many of you would still be here if I preached till midnight? Maybe a couple. Not many. But he preached till midnight. Then this young dude named Eutychus, he's sitting in a windowsill because the way they lit the rooms back then was with lamps, but the lamps were, they burned. Like they put smoke and inhalation. They didn't have carbon monoxide detectors back in those days. Well, guess what he did? He fell asleep. Then the dude falls out the window, three stories, and dies. This is what Paul does. I wish I could say I could do this as a, as a preacher. I wish I could. He goes down. He revives him, he gets him back up, and then he preaches till, sundown, till, till sunrise. He's like, what's the big deal? Well, I'll raise him from the dead. Okay, come on, let's go. Then he preaches at least like six more hours. And he knows he's getting ready to get, walk and go all the way down towards Ephesus the next morning, and he uses it that time to preach all night. Listen, listen, folks. What if Jesus came back tomorrow morning? What if he did? What if he did? What if Jesus Christ came back tomorrow morning and all the stuff that we had in our bank accounts or in our portfolio, what good would it be? What good would it be? What good would it be? Paul knew that. He preached like every single message was the last one he would ever preach. And then from there, the, the verses 13 through 16, they discuss his travels, another roughly 300 miles, and he purposely bypasses Ephesus because he's built such a relationship with the people in Ephesus. He knew the goodbyes would be so long there. So he, he goes to a little town called Miletus, and it's, and it's, so the total of this journey of the first 15 verses of chapter 20 is roughly 1,500 miles. So we got a map just to be able to, to, to show visualization. So, so right here it is. So Paul was first in Ephesus right here, and he leaves, this little red line is where he leaves to go. Now, he comes here to Corinth. This is where he learns of the plot because he was going to take a ship straight from here down to Jerusalem. And so he learns the plot. So then he walks all the way back. And then he takes a boat from there to Troas. And then 
comes down to Miletus. Now, what was the purpose of Paul's journey? It was to take up an offering for the church in Jerusalem. And we learn about that in Romans and in Corinthians. Here's what he did. He took representatives from all those different churches, and they took up a massive, massive offering to take to the Jerusalem church those despised Jews that hated the Gentiles. That's all these churches here. All these churches are Gentiles because there was a massive famine going on in Jerusalem. That was the purpose of Paul doing this. Now, if there's one word that I want us to remember, it's unity. Unity. If there is anything going on in the society in which we live right now, it is a complete and total lack of unity. Everybody hates everybody else. And it's, it's just, it's sad and it's toxic and it's just, it's disgusting. It is absolutely disgusting. And the church has got to lead out in unity. Here's the thing. The Gentiles learned the value of the mother church in Jerusalem. But when, when the Jerusalem church got that offering, they're like, oh my goodness. This faith with the Gentiles is legit. These dudes just saved our lives. Some theologians estimate that offering helped with food procurement that might have saved the lives of over a million Jews that were in the church. They totally took care of them. So Paul arrives in Miletus, okay? And he sends for the Ephesian elders, all the elders of all the little churches in Ephesus, he sends for them. Because we'll learn the Holy Spirit has told Paul that he will never see these men again. Never. He knows this side of eternity, he is never going to see them again. So do you think the words that Paul pens over the next 10 or 15 verses, do you think they're pretty important and we should pay attention to them? Because this was a church where Paul spent three solid years doing ministry. Day by day, every day, teaching and doing life with people. So what I wanna do, I want us to go on a journey over the next 10, 15 verses, and let's really marinate in what Paul has to say to these people because he knows he's never going to see them again. Verse 18, and when they came to him, meaning the elders from Ephesus, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived. Everybody say, how I lived. How I lived. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Okay, how many of us, including myself, could get up here and use just the way I lived as a testimony? Just the way I lived. I think it was Tertullian. It's kind of a debate on which church father coined this phrase, but, but he said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Paul said, you yourselves know how I lived the whole time I was with you. Folks, listen. People are watching. Parents, your kids are watching you. They're watching every move you make. Husbands, your kids are watching how you treat their wives, how you treat your wives. They're watching. The next generation is watching how we do life together. They are observing. Your coworkers, they're watching. And when they see a radical change, they want to know what's up. Look at verse 19, how he lived. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is one sentence, okay? This sentence leads us on an amazing journey of, of attributes that we must personify. So in other words, when you personify something, you're taking an attribute and you're putting it into motion. So there's several things a Christ follower must personify. And the first one is this, humility. This is such an issue. This is such an enormous 
issue. Listen, humility that, that he's talking about here, it is not an athlete that can run a 4240 and saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm not that fast. You know, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I, no, 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 that's, that's not what he's talking about. And so it's imperative that we truly understand because humility is the mark of a Christ follower. And if we're not willing to humble ourselves, <laughs> listen, we, 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 got, we got serious problems. Paul was an apostle. He did not allow his position to go to his head. Never. He humbled himself. He had a servant's heart. When he said he was serving the Lord with all humility, that word serving, the, the, the root word of it is a slave, a bond servant. Listen, Jesus Christ is Lord, and I, I'm his slave. Now, that's not a bad thing, and we're gonna get to that in just a moment, but Paul said, I, I was a slave to him with all humility. And here's the thing, serving God is essentially serving others. And I get it, that we don't, society teaches against that. It literally teaches against it, but it's gotta be the mindset. Here's the thing, when Paul's writing to the very church that he was at at Philippi, he says in Philippians 2, 3, he says this, do nothing from selfish ambition. So if you've got something you're doing and it's selfish ambition, Paul says don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in what? Humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You realize that there's not a if-then statement on there. Like you realize it's not as long as they have the same political beliefs as you or the same social beliefs as you. No, it's, it's, a, it's a period. It is literally unconditional that we ought to serve. Well, who Jesus Christ modeled this for us just a few verses later, about three weeks ago, when we talked about the downward spiral of humiliation that Jesus chose. Philippians 2, 7, and 8 is amazing. This is God, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he what? He humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming what? Obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Hey, dads, hey, you want to have an impact on your kids? Let them see you practice humility. Hey, dads, when's the last time you've apologized to your kids? Hey, married couples, you want to have a lasting impact on your kids? Humble, humble each other. Submit to one another. Love each other. That starts with humility. I'm, I'm just telling you guys, it's going to be hard. We're, we're jumping into a book of Ephesians next week, and I am pumped out of my mind about it. Ryan will tell you. I'm running around doing this, trying to keep from hurting my arm, and I'm going crazy about it. But here's the thing. Get ready. Get ready. The first three chapters are amazing because we find out who we are in Christ. But then four, five, and six, that's the application. And it talks about all this. If we're gonna humble ourselves, it's gotta be about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, here's the thing. You serving Jesus, it's not always gonna be smooth sailing. It almost never will be. Your marriage, your family, your work, your school, your kids, it's all gonna have adversity but you've got to maintain your humility through it. I cannot stress, again, how important it is. You want your life to have a maximum impact? You want to leave a legacy? We're going to get to that in just a moment. There's a big difference between a legacy and a dynasty. We shouldn't care less about a dynasty. That's a family. That's a family building an empire. Like in China, you remember the dynasties, the Ming dynasty. I'm talking about a legacy, an impression that you leave on the culture that lasts. This is where it begins. Listen, your life ain't a DVR. There ain't no pressing pause and rewinding and playing it back. You've got one shot. How are you gonna live your life? The next one, Paul says it, compassion. He says, serving the Lord with all humility, what? And in verse 19, 
and with tears. Paul had such compassion. Listen, we learn in all the letters that he wrote to letters in Rome and, and Corinth and Thessalonica how he shed tears. We learn in Romans how he, he cries for lost people. I, that's a concept I get so convicted of. Because again, I say it all the time. What if that bottled water over there I had to cure for cancer? I know four or five people in this room right now that struggle with cancer. What if I had a cure for it? Listen, folks, we got the cure for eternal cancer. There's 80,000 people in Henderson County that are not part of a local church. If those 80,000 people have not repented and have not placed their faith in Christ alone, by his grace alone, faith alone, they will spend eternity burning in hell. Do I need to repeat that? They will spend eternity. After 100 million years, the screaming and wailing will have only just begun. I, what are we doing? We, 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 need, we, we need to get out and show the love of Christ to people. Paul wept for baby Christians that kept screwing up. In Corinthians, he wrote tons of, of verses to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians saying he was weeping over new baby Christians falling back into their sin and begging God to sanctify them. He, he wept over false teachers that were permeating into the church, which is a huge problem in America right now where, where preachers are, are preaching this, this good they call it the prosperity gospel, but oh man, God's good and he just wants you to be happy and, and all this. No, 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 God wants your heart. He is Lord. And he wants you to bow to him and confess him as Lord. And the Lord knows he deserves it. As Amazing Grace says, he saved a wretch like me. Paul wept over it. He had such compassion over people. And he had compassion for people to be sanctified. Again, that big churchy word, sanctification, what does it mean? Here's what it means. Okay, I got saved. I repented. I placed all my faith in Christ. I'm justified. That's justification. I either die or Jesus comes back. I'm glorified. That's glorification. All that in the middle is sanctification where I'm trying to press on towards to be more like Jesus, and God keeps chipping the rough parts off of me. I just pray that one day God can put down a chisel with me and put on sandpaper. Because I got massive corners he's got to still lop off. So do you, by the way. Ain't no one in here perfect. We got to have compassion. Here's the next one. Ain't none of y'all going to like hearing this one. Suffering. We've got to personify Suffering. Now you're like, Nathan, what does that mean? Well, in the second part of verse 19, he says it. And with trials that happen to me. Now, if there's anyone that had trials, it was Paul. The dude wanted to go into, into deep Asia. God said, no, I want you to go to Macedonia. He goes to Philippi. He cast demon out of this poor teenage girl. She's rescued from demon possession. And because of that, he gets the soup beat out of him, and then he gets his legs put in stocks. In Lystra, he got stoned. They thought he was with rocks. They thought he was dead. And some of y'all got that. Okay, good. They thought he was dead, and these guys were professional rock throwers, I guess I'll say. Didn't want to say professional stoners, but professional rock stoners, <laughs> rock throwers. So they would have known if a dude was dead. They thought he was dead. He was unconscious. He was shipwrecked. He got beat all the time. It's almost like he reflected back on his letter he wrote to Rome that would have been a few weeks prior to what we're reading about right now. In Romans 5, 2, and 3, listen what he says. It seems counterintuitive. Through him, meaning Jesus Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Rejoice in hope. Amen. All right, look at the next verse. Not only that, but what? We rejoice in our sufferings. Anybody like that? Let's take that verse out. Listen to what he says, though, later on in verse 4. 
and then, or excuse me, no one that's suffering produces endurance, and then endurance produces character. Character produces what? Hope. You can't defeat hope. You can't stop hope. You can't. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Wow. So you've got this beautiful pathway of, of, of humiliation and, and then compassion and then suffering. And guess what that enables us to be? It enables us to personify boldness. Listen, folks, we, we, we need some boldness up in here. Seriously. And listen, I, I ain't talking about uh, the Western definition of, uh, of being bold and, and being known for what you're against and protest and all. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the right kind of boldness after you've been refined by humility and compassion and suffering and then bold. Listen to what Paul says in verse 20 in this sentence. How I did not what? Shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Listen, this is a common theme all throughout Acts. Remember way back in chapter four, Peter and John were given a defense to the Sanhedrin. And they're like, man, these dudes are bold, but they're just stupid Galilean fishermen. They shouldn't know anything. What'd they notice? They noticed that they had been with Jesus. They were bold. Peter and John come back and tell the church, what's the first thing they pray for? Boldness. What happens? The ground shakes. And they talk about boldness like they boldly share the gospel and the church starts to explode. When have you, when's the last time you've been bold with your faith? When's the last time? Worried about getting made fun of? Worried about being approved? When's the last time? Just love somebody? I mean, seriously, and I love the way Paul and the scriptures tie all this together. Look what he says to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 3.12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. See how he ties it together? That hope is everything. Do you have that hope? Because if you've got it, you've got, the base, you've got the ability to be bold and put it all on the line. Once, you've, once we've personified these, then it, it literally, it climaxes at love. We should personify love. How did Paul do that? He lived it out, and then he says what he preaches. There's no better way to love somebody. Look at the second half of verse 21. Repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. My goodness, what better way is there to love somebody? than to act like Jesus and then to share Jesus with them. Can someone please tell me a better way to love somebody? There's not. There's not a better way to love anybody than to live out like Jesus and then share Jesus with them. There's not a better way. It's the personification of love. So Paul refers to the past now, listen to this, and if it can't get any more mind-blowing, listen to what Paul says next. He starts telling what the future's gonna hold because the Holy Spirit's told him. He says this in verse 22, and now behold, in other words, look and see, because you ain't gonna believe this. I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except, ding, 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 the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city, that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Oh, joy. That's what he says. He said, I'm leaving. The Holy Spirit told me, get ready, it's going to get bad. He, he, Paul knows what God wants him to do, and Paul's got a glimpse at what it's going to cost. Listen, are, 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 we willing to, are we willing to do what it costs? Again, we're, we're talking about eternity here. Then, then here's, the, here's the, one of my favorite verses in all scripture, verse 24. But I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only, can everyone please say, if only. If only that I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Let me, let me ask you a question. How much do you value Jesus 
like, I mean, if you were literally, if you and, and your whole family and, and y'all were literally, you're, you're on a place and, and the ground fell out from you and you were, you were hanging on a, little, on a little bitty cord and there was lava right below and you're going to get ready to die. And then this dude comes and he reaches out his hand and he, and he gets you up out. How indebted would you be to that person? And to even compare that to what Jesus did would, would almost be heresy. It would almost be heresy. Well, it is. You can't compare it of what Jesus did for us. And, and Paul says right there, but I do not count my life of any value or pressure, if only. It reminds me of a, a missionary, James Calvert. When you think of the word Fiji, you think, oh man, I can't wait to go there. Well, it used to have a bunch of cannibals on it back in the early 1800s. And they were crazy, obviously, they were cannibals. A guy named James Calvert felt led of God to go reach them. And so he's driving, he's, he's on the boat going there, and the captain of the boat says, man, you're crazy. There's been other people that's going there. You're going to die. You know what he said to him? I already died before I came. <whistles> that's what he said. He wasn't worried about it. It reminds me when Paul's writing the church in Galatia, which is just right there, when he says in 2.20, he says this, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul knew he was already dead. He was alive in Christ. We should be determined to do whatever it takes, no matter whatever it costs. And here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. And I'm just going to say it. You may not like it. But, but any man or woman that never does anything except what can be done easily won't ever do anything worth doing. Have you only been doing easy stuff your whole life? I mean, is that it? Well, no, man, I work 70 hours a week, man. I'm making a ton of money, but that's easy. Listen, if you're in America, you can be rich. If you're willing for money to be your idol, everything is set up where someone with a, a, a pretty good brain and, and some things can, can get money. And Paul's getting ready to talk about that. So just get ready. He's getting ready to talk about our wallets, okay? Verse 25, and now behold, again, look and see, because you're not gonna believe me. I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Can you imagine the look on those dudes' face when he said, hey, by the way, when I get on that boat, you're never gonna see me again. These are the guys that Paul did life with for three years, every day. So now he's getting ready to say some prolific stuff. So listen to what he says in verse 26. Therefore, I testify you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. How many of us could say we're innocent of the blood of all? I can't. I wish I could. I've had so many blown opportunities where I could have shared Jesus. I could have showed Jesus. And here's the thing, he said the whole counsel of God. Listen, this is real unpopular teaching in the churches today, the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel. God wants our hearts, y'all. He wants our hearts. And then listen what he tells the elders. Verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his whole blood, with his own blood. Now, now, here's the thing. Do you notice how he tells them to examine themselves first? Listen, folks, if, if the oxygen masks drop out from the plane, again, they always say what? Put your oxygen mask on first before you help others. Even if it's a little kid, we've got to get healthy. We've got to examine ourselves. It's like in our men's group this past week, it was, we kept asking the question, where are you and what's your goal in life? What's your goal in life? Is your goal in life uh, to, to, to set your kids up forever and then to, to spend the last five years when your joints are hurting and, and you know when a snowstorm's coming and you're falling apart to pick up seashells? Is that your goal? Like, is that your goal? So just tell me you wanna live a dynasty and you don't care about a legacy. I know it sounds hard. I'm just teaching what the scriptures are saying. We cannot adequately care for others, though, if we neglect to care for ourselves. 
And that's spending time with God in the presence of God. We've got to do that. Then he says in verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Now here's the thing. We learn from Paul's writings to 2 Timothy, Timothy in 2 Timothy, and in Revelation that that indeed happened. False teachers came in and wreaked havoc on Paul's beloved church in, in, in Ephesus. And here's the thing, we've, we've already had some of that here that Ryan and I have had to deal with. And we will defend doctrine. And I may not look like much, but you start coming to me with wrong doctrine, and I don't get dogmatic, I get bull dogmatic. I'm not playing. We are here about Jesus Christ and him crucified, period. And, and so then he tells, then as if he knows that, he says this, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone. Again, there's that with tears, his compassion. And he says in verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. In other words, Paul's saying, be alert. And here's the beautiful thing. Paul writes in a lot of his letters, and this should be the goal that, that we as Christ followers should have. Paul always said, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Can, can you walk into your, your place of business or, or can you walk into a restaurant or can you walk into a place where you commonly hang out or can you tell your kids, hey, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ? Because that should be our goal. That should be our goal. Be imitators of me. And that's where Paul says, be alert. And, and so he People really who abide in Jesus, we're going to have these hearts. And that's where it's so important to abide in Jesus. And then we get to Acts 20, 33. And it says this, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Those are the last words the elders in Ephesus hear from Paul. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And here's the thing, I'm just gonna say it. There is nothing wrong with money. Absolutely nothing. It's a tool. No different than anything else. The love of money it's a big problem. And it's really big with people in my position. And I've gotta say this because it's in the scriptures. I don't avoid the rough text. I'm just gonna say it. If there is a pastor that's getting wealthy off the local ministry of a church, something is wrong. I'm just gonna say it. I figured I'd get a whole bunch of amens, but I, I'm just gonna say it. Paul just proves that right there. He just proved, I'm not a lover of anyone's silver or gold or apparel. Now, he does say in subsequent letters that he should get a fair pay. He even, he even brings Barnabas in and says, so Barnabas and I shouldn't, shouldn't receive money when he's writing to the church in Corinth. So I'm not saying there should be no money. It, it should be enough to be able to support wife and kids. But Paul is clear there. Listen, the love of money is terrible. It is doubly terrible for leaders in the church. It's bad. And here's the thing. Y'all see me act that way? Hey, come talk to me. I ask you to handle it biblically, which is Matthew 18. If you got any questions, read it. Come to me in private. But I'm, I, I've got to say that because Paul made it abundantly clear. Now, y'all says working hard to help the weak. That's the weak in faith that he's talking about. It's our job, the more mature Christians, to come around the baby Christians and help build them up and love them. That's the church. And here's what Paul did. He shared all possible truth with all possible people in all possible ways. And that's what we gotta do. Truth with grace. That's what he did. Now listen what happens. And this is to be there, because these were men's men that he was talking to. I mean, these dudes came for about 30 some odd miles on foot. Probably would have taken them two days to get there. 
These were men's men, knew that the Jews wanted to kill, the Orthodox Jews wanted to kill them, knew that the Greeks wanted to kill them. Everybody wanted to kill these guys. So these guys were men's men. Now look what happens. Last verses. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping. The original Greek there, I mean, it was, it was bitter, crying out to God, weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him. That, that was a, a very endearing thing to do there. Being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again and they accompanied him to the ship. And can you imagine how excruciating that would have been? Paul leaves there and, and, and ends up in Jerusalem and then he starts making his trip uh, to Rome. But those elders knew they would never see their leader ever again. Imagine the weeping that was on the part with the, with the crazy miracles that they would have seen. And, and here's the thing. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Billy Graham fan. I, he, his, his humility, in my opinion, was one, of his, was one of his greatest qualities. Every time he was interviewed, he just wanted to talk about all the bad he did and how he wished he had done this and wished he had done that. He never, I mean, there's no telling how many people God used him as a vessel to save, and all he wanted to do was talk about the bad of him. Every interview, every single interview, and his grandson said of him recently, he said, my grandfather was fat. He was faithful, he was available, and he was teachable. Every one of us gotta be faithful, we gotta be available, and we gotta be teachable. I'm gonna put that list up there one more time of things we need to personify. Because again, I'm gonna ask this question. Are you more interest, interested in leaving a legacy or a dynasty? And again, this isn't about money and material things. It's about your heart. Where are you? That's the question we kept asking our men's group this past Thursday. Where are you in your walk with God? Where's your heart? I want, to, I want to reflect back to that verse that Paul said in, in verse 24. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only, if only. How many times have you said if only? If only I'd have sold that at that stock price or if only I'd have bought that land when I had the chance or if only I could have closed that deal or if only my kid could have gone to that college. This is Paul's if only. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. See, here's the thing. Paul had an audience of one. And that was Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the greatest act of love he did is found in verse 19 where he says, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of what? Repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, that, that's, that's the epitome of it right there. Have you truly repented, truly repented, and turned away from your old life and placed 100% of your faith and trust and hope in Jesus Christ and him crucified? Because everything I just said is meaningless and worthless if you haven't done that. And if you have, please fill out a care card and let's get cracking. Because we got 80,000 people in this county, 25,000 people in Transylvania County, and I don't know how many people in Buncombe County that knew we need to meet them where they are and introduce them to this man named Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for what your words taught us today. Uh, God, it's been, it's been, uh, it's tough. These last words that Paul spoke to the leaders of the church in Ephesus, I mean, they're, they're challenging. <clears throat> man, oh man, God, what a, what a peace and joy that comes with it though. And yeah, it's hard. I, I can't wait. I cannot wait wait to sit down and talk with Paul. 
your New Testament, I mean, God, it, it documents so much of the bad that happened to Paul. But then he talks about the joy and the peace that he has in Christ Jesus. God, the last thing he says to those men in Ephesus, God, is if only, if only I may finish the course. Wow. God, let us not grow weary. God, convict us where we fall short. Anything we love more than you, God, is an idol. Remove it from its place as an idol, God. Help us be indwelt with your spirit and be full of your spirit, God. And, and for those here or by the sound of my voice, God, or, or, or listening to us online, God, if they're not sure that they've repented and trusted and put all their faith, God, please just have them reach out to us so we can just talk to them. Thank you for what you're doing in and through Hendersonville Church. And we're gonna continue to give you the glory and the honor. And God, if only we at Hendersonville Church can stay on your course and finish it. That's what we wanna do. In the name of Jesus, amen.